you nice and loud. Now. Yep. Good morning and welcome to our home. My name is Sally Jane. Please come on in and join us. It is time to turn off those noisy things and make sure that you have your Bible ready. How about sharing this video or starting a watch party? Lots of you know now that my mum has been away for the last three weeks working in the RVI, but now she's back. I missed her. Me and my brother um, prayed that she would come back and now she has. So how's it been, Mum? Well, it's great to be back. It's really good to be here in my family home this morning, being able to be in the same room as my family to do church. It's been amazing, though, to be able to be away and still connect online, so I've been really grateful for that. Um, God's been really good during this time, and he's, um, yeah, working miracles and doing amazing things, and, and he's been re I've been really grateful for God's presence during this time while I've been away. But, it's, as I said, it's, it's definitely great to be back. So this morning, um, as I said, it's really good to be with you. My name's Jo, um, as Sally Jane said. Um, welcome to our family home. And we would love for you to connect with us this morning. Join, <clears throat> join our little comments bit at the bottom of the page. Leave us a prayer request. Send us something in a direct message if you want to. Um, and we will try and feed that into the meeting as we go along today. Is that for me, Jack? Are you over to me now? Yeah. Okay, sorry. I was just looking at the notifications there. <laughs> Hard to keep an eye on everything at the um, same time. But yeah, hi, welcome. I'm Tom. It's really good to have you here with us this morning. We're so excited to have Joe back with us as well. Um, it's not the same, is it, connecting online? But it is a good substitute and we're going to do our best this morning. And I really just want to encourage you, before we go over to Matt and Brow's house to, to, uh, to worship together, I want to encourage you to invite God's presence into wherever you're at, in your, in your bedrooms, in your front rooms, whether you've got dressed, had your breakfast, drank your coffee and you're feeling ready for the day, or whether you're in your PJs, having a lazy morning, whatever you're doing this morning, let's invite God's presence to be with us. Because as we've been learning uh, through the last few weeks, it's God's presence is available to us all. If you don't know Jesus, that might be a weird thing to say, but God's presence is a place of safety and a place of refuge and a place of comfort this morning. So, I want to encourage you to invite God's presence into your home. Isn't it amazing that we don't have to go to a building? We don't have to build an altar. We don't have to worship at the feet of anyone but Jesus. And his presence is in, is in, in our bodies now, in our homes together. So I'm going to read to you. Um, and my prayer is that as I read this, before we go over to Matt's house, you'll start to experience God's presence this morning. But this is based on Psalm 46. God, you're such a powerful place and a place of safety to find refuge. You're a proven help in the time of trouble. More than enough and always available whenever I need you. So we will never fear, even if every structure of support were to crumble away. We will not fear, even when the earth quakes and shakes, moving mountains and casting them into the sea, for the raging roar of, of stormy winds and crashing waves cannot erode our faith in you. God has a constantly flowing river, whose sparkling streams bring joy and delight to his people. His river flows right through the city of God Most High, into his holy dwelling places. God is in the midst of his city, secure and never shaken. At daybreak, his help will be seen with the appearing of the dawn. The mighty Lord of angel armies is on our side. The God of Jacob fights for us. Everyone look. Come and see the breathtaking wonders of our God. Surrender your anxiety. Be silent and stop your striving and you will see that I am God. I'm going to say that again. Surrender your anxiety. Be still and stop your 
striving. You will see that I am your God. Something inside of me Knows there is surely more than this Echoes of eternity All around us There's music within my soul I'm more than these flesh and bones I know Whispers of a destiny Deep inside us this beating heart like a drum it will be for you this heart like a drum it will be my soul my soul sings to you this beating heart i was made i was made for you my god evermore evermore my soul my soul sings for you Marked by your fingerprints There's evidence running through these veins That we are a masterpiece With a maker Formed in the secret place A mystery born of love and grace You had a name for me And a purpose this beating heart like a drum it will beat for you This heart like a drum it will beat my soul My soul sings for you This beating heart I was made, I was made for you My God evermore, evermore My soul My soul sings for you my life, my life beyond your all to God My every breath exalting you My life beyond your all to God This heart like a drum beating strong for you This heart beyond your all to God My every breath exalting you My heart beyond your all to God this heart like a drum beating strong for you This beating heart like a drum it will be for you This heart like a drum it will be my soul My soul sings for you This beating heart I was made, I was made for you My God evermore, evermore my soul my soul sings for you This beating heart like a drum it will be for you This heart like a drum it will be my soul My soul sings for you This beating heart I was made, I was made for you my God, evermore, evermore, my soul, my soul sings for you. song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, a name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save 
Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you Holy, there is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you, Jesus Jesus, name above every other name Jesus, the only one that could ever save Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you, oh, we live for you Holy, there is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder And show me who you are and fill your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in love to those around me I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation I will put my trust in you alone and I will Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I trust in you alone, and I will not be shaken. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken Holy, there 
There is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Thanks, guys. Well, isn't that awesome? I've really learned that firsthand this week, that when we put our trust in God, we will not be shaken. And I promise you, if you make a choice to do that this morning, God will be with you and you will not be shaken. Mm. Well, I've got quite a few announcements to get through, so I'm going to try and get through them quickly before we, um, we move on. Um, first up, Kids Church you should have had an email with a link in it if you haven't and you want to join us for kids church which is straight after this meeting then post us um, a direct message a personal message and we will send you a link showing you how to join in with that it would be great to see you next up we have got our church prayer meeting on tuesday evening at 7 30. again you probably would have had an email but if you haven't and you want to join us it, it, we would love to have some new people come and join us and it's a great opportunity to be able to do it from our homes so there will be a comment on the a link on the comments at the down end below, of this yeah. meeting down below under this at the end of this meeting that'll be there for you next up something really exciting it's not coming up just yet but we are going to have a church quiz online while we're all at homes in in our homes in lockdown and that is going to be on the 1st of may at 7 30 so get that into your diaries it's we a friday all, evening it's a friday evening friday the 1st of may 7 30 yeah. stick it in your diaries um we have been running a coronavirus relief fund that you might have heard about over the few last few weeks you can still donate to that and we would love you to again personal message us if you don't have the bank details and we can get those to you um, send us it with a reference of cv so we know what your donation is for and it, you guys have been so generous and so far we've raised over 700 pounds yeah. which is amazing Amen. Um, last up next week is going to be awesome we've got Ian Galloway with us and he is going to be speaking on the Gospel of John so don't miss out on that yeah can't wait for Ian to be with us special friend of the church he's on sabbatical at the moment and um, he's um, he's a great speaker so we, we've got a special guest speaker for you next week and really looking forward to having him with us just before we move on um, we're going to just spend a bit of time praying it's really important at the moment isn't it to to, to basically present our requests to God. We're encouraged throughout scripture to petition God actually and to ask him to move and he doesn't always move the way we think he's going to but sometimes he does and sometimes he will directly respond with a big great big yes and he will work on our behalf for us. So um, we've had some prayer requests come in during the worship and they're difficult things to deal with emotionally and even more so because people are on their own at the moment, isolated from, from other people. Stu has sent in um, a request again just for him and Pauline and his family and particularly for his mum who is um, moved on to palliative care now. She's got COVID-19 um, and she's at the end of her life. And at the moment she's on her own and at some point Stu will be allowed in to share the final moments with her so we really need to pray over Stu, over pauline over his mum and and let's just let's just ask god to flood them with with his presence this morning we're going to pray as well for gordon and carol gordon's mum passed away recently and on monday they're traveling down a three-hour journey to a funeral that will only be allowed to be short and there will be no physical touching and they'll have to maintain distance and then they'll have to drive back again for three hours this is not the way to grieve is it this is not how God's made us to, um, to, to mourn our loss. Sorry. So we need to be praying into these situations and asking God to, to flood us with, with his presence and to give us strength as well. And we need to look forward to the right time when we can mourn and grieve together. Helen's also um, asked us to pray for her colleagues. She works in, in ICU and is right on the front line. And, um, and two of her, her colleagues are battling for their lives, having picked up this, this virus that um, they have been looking to help others beat. And they themselves are now um, in intensive care being treated. And we need to pray for Helen. She's shared some wonderful stories about how they've been praying together as a team during their, their, their daily team meetings and how people are really crying out for God's help. And we need to pray into those situations and pray God's healing hands 
on, on her colleagues there mm. in ICU. So we're going to pray over those things. I want to encourage you. I'll just check that no more prayer requests came in as well. But um, we're going to check. Keep checking these comments. Please send them in. We're committed to praying for you as a team. Joe and I and other people, mm. Helen, Den and, and the people involved this morning will be praying over your, your request that you put in. And together as a church, let's pray over Stu's uh, situation and his mum. Let's pray over Gordon and Carol that journey down that they would be able to grieve and that God would comfort them. And that we want to pray over um, Helen and her colleagues as well and mm. God's healing hands into that situation. So let's pray together. Father God, uh, this virus is causing um, a meltdown, God. It's a pandemic that has just changed everything. And God, I know that even just my little bit of emotion is just a fraction of, of, of how you feel towards us. Thank you that you're with us in these situations. And God, I want to pray um, over Stu, Pauline and, and, their, and uh, Stu's mum. God, in these final moments, would she know you're with yes, she her? Does. Would she know what you've done for her? Mm. And I pray, God, that you would give Stu uh, protection and safety as he goes in and spends mm. those last few moments with her. And also just give them clarity in their conversations. Let them express what they need to express to each other, God. Mm. And, and help Stu in this process of uh, grief and mourning. Mm. And God, we want to pray for Gordon and Carol, God. Be with them as they travel, Lord, all this way to say what is an inadequate goodbye, God. Help them to, to deal with their grief and their loss. And Lord, you promise us that when we grieve, when we mourn our loss, you will comfort us. That's why we're blessed when we have lost so much. We've known plenty, God, when we've known nothing. We're blessed when we mourn loss because you comfort us. And to be comforted by you is no small thing. So I pray your comfort into that situation. And God, for, for Helen, Helen's colleagues, They've been fighting this virus on the front line and now they're fighting for their lives themselves, God. I pray your miraculous healing yes, hands Jesus. upon their lives, God. Would they wake up and testify that the God of Abraham, your, the, the God of Jacob, the God who fights for us, mm. has touched their lives and healed them in their hospital beds this morning, this very moment. We pray these things in your mighty name, yes, Jesus. Jesus. Thank you that you're going to speak to us this morning. Amen. Amen. So we're going over to Matt Poxon now. Matt's been doing a great job during this series. Um, how beautiful are the, on the mountains are the feet that bring good news. And we're going to go over to Matt for an exciting look at the life and times of Jesus post-resurrection after he's risen from the dead. So Matt, can't wait to hear from you. Over to you. Thanks, Tom. That's brilliant. Right. Good morning. Isn't it fantastic that we have the technology to meet together to worship collectively, even though we're separate? And there is an element of weirdness to it, but it is still brilliant. This is the penultimate message in our gospel series. We've looked at the prophecies for telling the coming of Jesus. And we've gone through the life of Jesus. And on Easter Sunday, Tom spoke about the death and resurrection of Christ. And you can see the Crawfords already put up the, the scriptures that we're looking at today. So we'll look and look at those in a second. And today we're going to look at the 40 days after the moment of his resurrection. But Jesus is still dwelling on the earth and it's a time between the resurrection and his ascension into heaven. And what I'm going to do is look at some of the people Jesus interacts with and draw out how this should impact our lives and what impact it has in our lives today. And so we just really need to set the scene so we can try to get some understanding of how Jesus and his companions must have been feeling at this point in the story. And I use the word companions because it's not just those 12 disciples that we need to think about here. There's a whole host of followers who are with Jesus. And it's not just those 12 people we're going to be looking at. And part of the, the issue we have is because of the way the Bible is written, we don't get a lot of emotional detail from it. So we've got to use our empathy and we've got to imagine in, to imagine what these people are going through at this time. And you know, these people who are following Jesus, they've given up everything. And I mean everything to follow Jesus at this point. These men and these women, they've given up careers, they've given up their family, they've given up reputation and prestige and a place in society to follow a teacher 
who has essentially been outlawed by the authorities. The disciples walked away from jobs which would have secured their livelihoods. And there were women in Jesus' group who would have given up even more. They will have given up the prospects of a good reputation. They'd have given up security in marriage because they're following a man who regularly hangs around with prostitutes. And these people have banked absolutely everything on Jesus being the Messiah, on Jesus coming to save them, to save Israel. And they've walked into Jerusalem, they've seen thousands of people cheering on and shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. And now in the past few days, they've seen the person they've left everything for, and I mean everything, be tortured and crucified as a common criminal. Now, imagine that. You've staked everything on someone and then they're gone. Imagine your grief and your shock and your horror. Absolutely everything is gone. And we're in the privileged position of knowing how the story ends. We know Jesus has raised about to the tomb, he's raised to life again. And then goes on teaching before ascending back to heaven. Which in the Bible will only take a few chapters. It's a few hundred words to explain a one-off miraculous event. You can read the passages in maybe 15 minutes. But I completely imagine if you have followed Jesus into Jerusalem on those days and you were with him on Friday, time would have stopped. And those days until the resurrection would have felt incredibly, unbelievably long. And you know, it's really weird. Yet again, as we see time and time again, Jesus does not do the way do things the way we would expect them. If I was personally the newly resurrected Jesus, and obviously I'm not, I would be going through an all-out shock and awe campaign to announce my resurrection. I would have hosts of angels singing beautiful harmonies, cherubs firing fireworks off, lightning going through the sky, some sort of divine light show to announce that I had returned. I had beaten death, I am raised again as the Messiah. And like, it would be amazing, it would be awesome to watch. But you know, that's not the way of God's kingdom. In the kingdom of heaven, the resurrection isn't about a massive light show. It's not about this massive moment. It's about a quiet moment where Jesus comes back and he renews the friendships. He renews relationships. And instead of having angels singing, he comes back quietly and then he goes and visits his friends. And we're going to look at three sets of friends that he goes to visit. We're going to look first at Mary Magdalene and how he goes to visit her. We're going to look at Thomas and we're going to look at Peter as well. Now, I'm not going to read out big chunks of scripture here because we're trying to keep these short and if I do that, it'll take up all the time. But the passages which I'm referring to will flick up on the screen just like that. Okay, so firstly, let's look at Mary Magdalene. And this is in John 20 verses 1 to 18 and also in Matthew 28 verses 1 to 8. And, you know, I love this story because it's so countercultural to the day. And in lots of ways, it's still countercultural to our day as well. And you need to remember that 2,000 years ago, women were for the most part a very marginalised group. The power lay with men. And in Judea, in Israel 2,000 years ago, the power didn't even lie with the Jewish men. It lay with an occupying army. So Mary Magdalene had followed Jesus from the early days of his ministry. She had financially supported Jesus' ministry and invested time and money into Jesus. She had invested herself and now it was all gone. And you know, she would have invested herself into Jesus as well. And she's commonly associated with that story of anointing Jesus' feet with perfume a few days before his crucifixion. And it might not be true, that might not have been that Mary, but it doesn't really matter. But what does matter is that we understand that she's part of this inner circle. 
And she's incredibly close to Jesus, who has healed her early on in the Gospels. And this is why I love this woman's story. It's because after everything she has been through, and she was stood at the foot of the cross as he's crucified, she's seen a Roman soldier, a centurion, stab a spear into Jesus' side. She'll have seen the body taken down, probably seen it put into the tomb. Her faithfulness to Jesus is that three days later, having seen all of this, she doesn't give up. She goes back to the tomb. She goes to find Jesus. And beautifully, Jesus responds to her faithfulness. Mary Magdalene is then completely honoured by Jesus. And she's honoured because she gets to be the apostle to the apostles. And that's the sort of name which is given to her, the apostle to the apostles. But what that means is she's the one who gets to tell the people the good news first. She's the one who goes to tell the people who are going to tell the other people the good news. And that is so amazing. This woman who has lost everything from a marginalised group gets the most important bit of good news first. And that is amazing. And you know, it brings me such hope and such joy to know that even if you are from a group of people the rest of the world ignores, even if you are someone who has lost everything, and Mary definitely had lost everything at this point in the story, even if the world has written you up and Mary has been written off, God still chooses people like Mary, people like you and people like me. And I read a few bits of like academic stuff and books on this and 2,000 years ago, if you wanted to give your story credibility, you would have chosen a man as a witness. So by choosing a woman, it's completely countercultural. And this is a quote. People saw women as unreliable witnesses who were forbidden from giving testimony in court. Women weren't credible. They couldn't even be trusted according to the laws of the day. So how incredible is it that after the world had written them off, Mary was the witness to the greatest moment ever, the resurrection. And I think that's probably really important for some people today because you may feel written off, you may feel ignored by society because you're isolated, you're on your own. But Jesus said time and time again in the gospel that whatever you are, whoever you are, there is no one that he doesn't care about. So take hope and take joy in that. Secondly, the next person. And this is, we're going to look at the interactions between Thomas and Jesus. And mainly, it's because I feel sorry for Thomas. And I think it's really unfair that because of Thomas, we have the idiom doubting Thomas. And it's really harsh to question Thomas's integrity. His love was so great for Jesus that at the time of the trial and crucifixion, he'd wanted to head back to Jerusalem and die alongside Jesus. That's his commitment to Jesus. And it's no doubt, it's, sorry, it's not doubt that Thomas is struggling with. And the bit of the Bible, it's going to be John 20, verse 24 to 29. So thanks for that, Crawford, if you could just take that down now. Jesus had appeared to 10 other disciples, but Thomas wasn't there. I don't know where he was, but Thomas was somewhere else and he appears to the other disciples. And Thomas demands evidence of Jesus' resurrection, which to me seems entirely reasonable. If I'd seen somebody crucified, I would want to see some hard facts that they were back alive. I honestly think a better name for Thomas, instead of doubting Thomas, would be, let me get this right, Empirical Evidence-Based Belief System Thomas, which is a bit of a mouthful and doesn't roll off the tongue like doubting Thomas, but is probably more accurate. Thomas's lack of belief is fair. He had a relationship with Jesus, and that relationship had died when Jesus had died on the cross. He couldn't fathom the possibility that the person he loved could still be alive. The grief for Thomas was still too near. I think Jesus understands this. 
I think Jesus gets this from Thomas. And there's no condemnation in Jesus when he speaks to Thomas about it. He understands the grief. He understands the loss. And he understands all the pain that Thomas goes through as he understands all the pain that we go through and all our grief and all our loss. And maybe for you at this time of hardship, you're feeling grief and loss. Maybe you feel that part of your relationship with Jesus has died through, through hardship and through grief. And I really honestly feel that through this time, through the ascension of Jesus wants you to know that he's alive and your relationship is still strong with him. And it's not about you and it's not about your doubts. The relationship is alive because Jesus is alive. Jesus didn't die for that one-off moment of atonement for sin. He died to fix our relationships. And today our relationship is fixed with Jesus because of Jesus. And then the last person I want to look at is this last sort of conversation that Jesus has with the disciple Peter. And we need to look at how Jesus deals with Peter. And there's a reinstatement because you've got to remember that just before the crucifixion, Peter has been separated from Jesus and Peter denies Jesus three times. And Peter now not only has to deal with the grief of the loss of his best friend and of the person he loves, but also with the guilt of his actions. And he's got to deal with these two emotions which must have been completely welling up inside him. And then Peter's out fishing with some of the other disciples. And Jesus appears on the beach near to the boat. And Peter, in his haste, decides, I'm not staying in the boat. I'm getting out of the boat. I'm going to go see Jesus. And he jumps out of the boat and he wades, he swims, he does whatever he does to get to the beach to see Jesus. And there must have been such emotion, such a build-up of emotion in Peter at this point. Because his friend and the teacher who's let down in such a big way is alive again. And that's amazing. But there's other things in, in Peter's past which he's having to contend with now. And because the Bible is short on emotional detail, we've sort of got to fill the gaps in and we've got to plug the gaps with our own understanding of how humans work and with our own empathy. But what I think is amazing is, as Peter meets Jesus, there's absolutely no holding back from Jesus. There's no reservation about holding back. In the text, when you read it, there's no direct mention of Jesus bringing up Peter's denial. And instead of reconciliation meetings, instead of counseling sessions and therapy to deal with the pain, the hurt. What Jesus does is Jesus holds a breakfast barbecue. And like, that's amazing. Jesus' actions, yet again, don't meet up with our expectations. Instead of putting the guilt trip on Peter, Jesus is cooking fish for his friends. So today, if you feel like you can't come to Jesus because of the stuff you've done in your life, know this. Jesus, who died for your sins, has come back to have a relationship with you. He wants to know you, and he's waiting to have a metaphorical, obviously, beach barbecue with you. And that goes for Christians who feel the guilt, the weight of guilt and shame on them. But it also goes for those people who don't know Jesus. And if that's you, and you've never considered a relationship with Jesus before, please take this opportunity to connect with us as a church, connect with somebody who is a Christian and talk to us about Jesus, talk to us about Christianity so that we can explain to you why Jesus is so amazing and why we believe the things we do. And you know, that's not the end of the story. It's not just that Jesus comes back and renews these dead relationships through his resurrection. The disciples don't then fade into obscurity they go on to spread a radical relational religion. And Christianity is based on relationships. 
And Jesus' dialogue with Peter ends up with him giving three instructions. The instructions to Peter are this. Feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, and feed my sheep. And you know, these are not divine house-sitting instructions, a part of Jesus' last will and testament to Peter. I, Jesus, bequeath my flock of 25 rare breed Aramaic sheep to Peter. It's not that. This is Jesus telling Peter to disciple and look after people. And these words are so vital at this time. As we head into a continuation of lockdown, as food banks begin to overrun, as people are isolated and lose their livelihoods because they can't go to work, as people begin to run out of savings, Jesus' words to Peter are also his words to us. And that's our challenge. We need to be feeding, feeding the sheep, the lambs. We need to be feeding people. We need to be taking care of the people in our streets, our towns, and our communities. And it's not just the people within our church community. It's all people. And I'll finish with this. And this is a prayer from um, an organisation called Red Letter Christians. And I think it really summarises the words of Peter. So I'll just pray this and then I'll finish it. I'll go back over. Okay. Lord Jesus. You taught us to love our neighbour and to care for those in need as if we were caring for you. In this time of anxiety, give us strength to comfort the fearful, to tend the sick and to assure the isolated of our love and your love for, for your name's sake. We are not a people of fear, we are a people of courage. And we are not a people who protect our own safety. We are a people who protect our neighbour's safety. We are not a people of greed. We are a people of generosity. We are your people, God, giving and loving wherever we are, whatever it costs, for as long as it takes, wherever you call us. Amen. Thanks, Matt. Um, What a great message. Jesus inviting us into a kingdom, God's kingdom that is relational, it's about friendship and it's also just about a party, enjoying food on a beach together. What a great metaphor. Listen, as we're we're closing up today, let's keep Stu and his his mum in our prayers. Um, Let's be praying for Gordon and Carol on Monday as they go to Gordon's mum's funeral. Let's be praying as well for Helen and her colleagues in ICU. And also, I just really want to uh, give a shout out and a mention to Richard and Lydia, and, and Lydia who's uh, booked in for a C-section on Friday. Let's pray for them. Let's pray for them before Friday, and let's pray for them on Friday for this wonderful miracle that's going to be a gift of a baby uh, to them. So that's Friday. I think she's booked in at 7 a.m. Remember on Tuesday, there's no pressure for you to attend, but if you'd like to attend, we'd love to see you at our prayer meeting, and the link will be popping up around now in the comments section if you haven't had it via email already and we're going to gather to pray and we'll pray about these things and so much more and if you've got something to pray for come with that and we'll pray for it together and um remember ian's with us next week ian galloway and i'm really excited to hear him presenting on john's gospel kids it's going to be your turn in a sec so we're going to see you as soon as this meeting finishes get on zoom get on that link join us the kids team are ready and waiting And um, for the rest of us, let's go on our way today. Whatever it is we've got to do, whether we're locked in, whether we've got to go to work and whatever we've got to do, let's remember that Jesus is inviting us in to a relationship with him. And if you're already on the inside of that relationship, then you are, as Matt said, you're required, you're asked to go and help those that need help. But if you're on the outside, you don't understand, you're not part of that party. You know you're not, you don't know Jesus. And I want to encourage you, Take that bold step, either reach out to Jesus himself and ask him into your life, or how about reaching out to us to have that discussion with you at Hope Church? And we would love to have that talk with you. So that's it for this morning. It's been wonderful to gather today. Well done, the Matts. Well done, Matt Brow. Well done, um, Matt Pox and great talks. Thank you, everyone, for joining with us today. And we will see you, if not on Tuesday, here next week on Sunday. Have a great week, everyone. Be blessed. See you soon.